Okay. Hello. All right, so I'm going to set the stage for this talk, which is Austria in the first week of May in 1945. Uh, this is the final week before the official surrender of Germany in World War II. Uh, Hitler had committed suicide on April 30th, and Germany surrendered on the 7th. So this is right in the middle, and this is officially the last battle, as far as Europe is concerned, of World War II. Um, it's called the Battle for Kessel Eater, and um, it lasted for about one day, and I'm sure that doesn't sound very exciting. Like, this is the last battle, and it was one day? What's the big deal? There were battles that lasted months, years, whatever. So, but the important part is the forces that were involved in this. So, in the bad guy corner, uh, or rather the on the offensive, and they've been very offensive lately in the news, uh, the Nazis, the Waffen-SS. Uh, absolutely, yeah. Um, for a distinction about them, the SS, the Schusstaffel, as they're known in German, is basically the, are the, the Waffen-SS are the military division of the Nazi party. The Wehrmacht is the German army that's not associated with a p particular political party, but that's important, and we'll point about that later. So those are the bad guys. Um, in the defensive corner, we have a group of French VIP POWs, these are prisoners of war, um, an American tanker and 14 of his troops, and a bunch of Germans, including their captain and a defecting Waffen-SS officer, all fighting together on the same side. Of course, this would happen in the very last battle of World War II. So, um, again, Castle Itter. This is in Austria. It's about the western end, or sorry, the eastern end and in the northern corner of the country. It's this gigantic, you know, literally enormous, spacious, it's actually more of a manor than a castle. It was originally a manor. It passed through royalty and, you know, artists and various things like that until there was a fellow who bought it and was like, I'm going to turn this into a hotel. Uh, and then added various castle-like structures to it and made it actually a castle. And this was basically where you went for your vacation getaway if you were rich and famous and fancy. This was basically Dubai before Dubai was Dubai. And this was where you went. So, but, as all good things come to an end, what happened to Castle Eater? It's what happens at the end of every argument. This guy. <laughs> so, yeah, Hitler, end of every argument. Etc. Um, so in 1938, Austria was annexed, and Castle Itter was originally they were using it as the HQ for a particular division of the German force, which is called, and I'm not making this up, the German Alliance for Combating the Dangers of Tobacco, because <laughs> if there was if there was only one one good thing that Hitler was about, it was the fact that he was a huge anti-smoking person. He absolutely abhorred it, and he maintained his policies like that while he was in charge of Germany. That's not to say that there's anything good about Hitler, but he was, that is, is very, 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 very important to him. So Castle Eter was the centerpiece for that. But after that, under Himmler's direction, they said, we should turn this, it's, it's basically a hotel right now, so we should take very important prisoners, I think it was pronounced Ehren Heftingle, um, which is honor prisoners in German, and it was basically, if we collect POWs who are particularly famous, very, very important, very, very valuable. We want to put them up in the prison, give them nice rooms, give them nice food. I, you know, basically everything just like, we're going to treat you well until the war is over. You just can't escape. And that's what, um, and that's what Castle Eater was turned into. And it was already kind of an ideal fortress for this. It had steep ravines all around it. It had big sloping walls. They put a bunch of razor wire around it so that nobody could get out. But other than that, it was like, Cool, nice, relaxing place. I'm just going to hang out till the war's over. Cool, cool. All right. So, May 1945. And uh, among the French prisoners, we had a couple of former prime ministers, uh, a few French army generals, a trade union leader, um, several members of the resistance. Um, some of them brought their associated partners. And, of course, a tennis champion. <laughs> Makes sense with the rest of them, right? So, um, the battle for Castle Eter is about these prisoners in particular, because the goal was either, well, the Allies managed to defeat the SS and save the prisoners, or the SS managed to take the castle and capture it, and since it's getting to the end of the war, we can either try and use them for one last dash of, we have some power, or, ah, eh, screw it, let's just kill them. So that was what the battle was about. 
So I'm going to go through the sequence of events. There's a lot of stuff, and if you're used to watching Game of Thrones, it's that level of names and details. So not that level of depth, though. We, we're, we're not there. So we're going to start. We're up. This is where, um, this is where Eater Village and Eater Castle is. And the French VIP PO devs are there, and they are, he and they are held by Sebastian Bimmer, which is the head SS guy. Uh, and so he, in a daily routine, allows his handyman, who is a Croatian named Zvonko Kukovic, and he says, you're good to go out for supplies. I mean, he's the handyman. He gets to go out for a thing. What he doesn't know at this time is that Kukovic has been working with the French VIPs who managed to smuggle in a radio, and they go, hey, the Allies have made it to Innsbruck, which is not very far away. You've got to get to Innsbruck and see if you can get the American soldiers to come to Castle Eter and get us. So Kukovic takes off, and he heads to Innsbruck and runs into an American army. Cool. Not long after that, however, you have Edward Viter, who is known as the Butcher of Duckau, and he shows up at the castle bragging, like, oh, look at me. Well, Duckau might be shut down, but I just killed a ton of Jews. Ha, 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 ha. And two days later, he kills himself. So the handyman is gone and might have met with the Allies to, because of how long he's been gone. And this very important SS general just killed himself. So Vimmer takes off. Now the French VIPs are there. They don't have anyone officially holding them there, but the whole area is surrounded by little cells of SS. So there's nowhere for them to really go. Um, but they also haven't heard back from Kukovic, the handyman. So they send this fellow, Andres Krobot. He's a Czech, and he is a cook. And so they say, here, you try, try going to Innsbruck or somewhere else along the way and see if you can get this message to the Allies. And so Krobot takes off to a nearby town, which is Virgil. And when he gets there, he meets Captain Josef Jangel. Uh, or no, it's Gangel, actually. Uh, he is the head of the Wehrmacht at that point that is sitting in Virgil. Now, Wehrmacht, again, is not the SS. It's the German army that will just operate under orders, but they're not politically minded. Now, Gangel, at this point, he's decorated. He's gotten the German Iron Cross several times. E extremely distinguished military career. Absolutely a fantastic soldier. He's well recommended. He's not really a Nazi, though. He just likes serving his country. He's getting kind of fed up with Hitler's bullshit. And he's like, all right, we're kind of losing the war anyway. The Nazis are really kind of assholes. And maybe, what if I went to the Americans, gave up, and talked to them about trying to rescue these French prisoners and fought the SS in the process? So um, Gangel and his lieutenants uh, decide to head to Kustein, which is another major Austrian city, and they know that the Americans have arrived there. Once they get there, they reach Captain Jack Lee. He's American. They tell him the story of, well, of course he is, obviously. <laughs> How more American of a name can you get? <laughs> so great. Uh, so, yeah. uh, they, so they tell him the story of Castle Inter, and er, they go, we have all the Wehrmacht here. They're in Virgo. We can just turn the entire town over to you and can we not be arrested, and can we help rescue the, the French prisoners? So Lee's like, this sounds pretty good. I'm not sure if I believe you, though. So can we verify this story? So um, Gangel, who's been riding around in an official army you know, little vehicle at this point, is like, well, I obviously look undercover, so I'm totally fine with this. So let's go to Virgil, and then let's go to Castellator, and you can see the stories. So, and so all of them are together. So they hover to Virgil. Um, Virgil is instantly surrendered under Gangle, and so they go, okay, cool, story checks out. They head up to Castle Eter, they meet the French, confirm the rest of the details of the story, and Lee says, cool, I'm going to go get a big army, come back here, hold the fort down until the SS are totally gone, and we should be all set. So they head back to Kufstein. He contacts his commander, and this guy's like, you want to defend a bunch of French prisoners? The war's almost over. You don't need that many troops. So there's some negotiation, manages to get some of it, takes some of them um, out to Vorgel in order to just hold the place down. They drop off a whole amount of the contingent there and a lot of the Wehrmacht, so they say, okay, we need to go back and defend the castle. What are we going to have? 14 American soldiers, 10 Germans, and one Sherman tank. This should be fine. <laughs> <laughs> so they head back to the castle. They literally take the tank 
turn it so that the gun is facing outward, back up the hill, <laughs> stick the tank in like the basically the driveway, as it would be, of the castle. Wedge it in there, just like, cool, you can't get to the non-armored part at the back of the tank. They all take up arms, they wait in the battlements, and it's like, cool, we are ready to go. <laughs> so, at 4 a.m., shots ring out, and they realize that SS are all around the castle. They are either hiding in the woods or actually trying to get a little bit more daring coming up some of the walls. And by 10 o'clock, they realize there's about 100 to 150 SS all around the castle. Um, at this point, the SS orders are kill everyone inside. Kill the French VIPs, kill all of their, uh, uh, you know, kill everyone protecting them, everything. So just absolutely exterminate everyone there. Um, the Sherman tank is destroyed by an anti-tank missile. In an attempt to protect one of the French VIPs, Gangle is assassinated by a sniper's bullet. So the situation is not really looking that good. <laughs> and they're all hanging out. And they're running low on ammo. What are they going to do? And the phone starts ringing. <laughs> Why is there a phone? Well, as it turns out, the, ra the only radio that they had at that point was inside the tank. The tank is toast. But they had a phone that was connected to Vorgel. Remember this whole time there's been this handyman, Kukovic, that's been hanging out over in Innsbruck where the Ar Americans actually were? Well, he found a ton of American troops over in Innsbruck talked to them, told them this entire harebrained story, and said, okay, we need to head back to Castle Eater. So the heroes are still trying to defend themselves, and eventually with Gangle dead and with the Wehrmacht pinned down, they're just like, screw it. Give a bunch of guns to the French. They'll be fine. <laughs> the French have no idea how to use weapons because it's just like they're diplomats and things like the French army general does, but aside from the Tennis player, totally knows how to shoot a gun. So they just <laughs> let loose and are just like, I may not be hitting anything, but I'm trying. <laughs> so not, 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 not really working so well. So other American contingent. Um, uh, so when Lee reached out to his colonel, they said, there's another division, they're coming, and they're going to be right behind you. This division is not right behind them. They keep running into SS uh, patrols along the way, and at one point, one of their majors is told, uh, you're getting into this battalion's territory. They're already there. You're overstepping. What are you doing? We're, no, you can't go this way. And the guy's like, this is not hard. You need to let me send like one or two tanks and a bunch of troops, and we can actually beat the SS. Uh, no, I don't think it's necessary. So the guy goes, okay, I'm not going to send any troops. Hangs up. And decides... This is John Kramers is the name of the major. He leaves the battalion, he takes Kukovic, and he gets in a jeep and drives to Vorgel. He finds the tanks and the, in the infantry and everything that's been set up and waiting there, hears the whole story, and starts talking to Lee over the telephone. Gets the whole, we're low on ammo, you know, help us. They literally said something like, they're bombing the bajagers out of us. <laughs> Such a great phrase. I really like that. So there's no SS in Vergel. They don't really have that much opposition on the way because the SS are all pointed at the castle. So they said, okay, can we do this? They get a hold of Lynch back there and say, you know, that other guy wouldn't send us any infantry, but you will, right? So he says, fine, go. Take all the infantry and head to Castle Eater. So while they're, they, they get most of the way there, and then they're trying to figure out the last span of the way to get from the village up to the castle. And Kramers and his men are approached by a fellow described as a tall, thin, and athletic-looking man. <laughs> Not quite this guy, but in fact, it's uh, Jean Barotro, which is the French tennis champion. <laughs> Over the course of his stay in the castle, he escaped three times while the SS were running it, because the whole time, like, they're like, you can go walk out on the grounds. We want you to be comfortable. Dude is extremely athletic. He's a tennis champion. So he went running around the grounds all the time. He would scale the walls and go down the cliffs several times, but he gets stopped by either the razor wire or the patrols. Well, now there are no patrols. The SS aren't really paying attention because they're just shooting and trying to kill everybody. So he dresses up like an Austrian prisoner, scales the wall, goes down, runs into the SS. He's just like, hey, guys, what's going on? <laughs> and they don't really pay him any mind because they're looking for Americans, Wehrmacht, and French. And he's you know dressed up in Austrian colors and things like that. So he says, okay, I will show you another way up. And I came all this way. I know where every single SS group is parked. So I can show you every single place that they are. They go through this. A dozen SS are captured. Uh, there are a few fatalities as well, but there's not a single American casualty. And they manage to 
you know, kill scores of them as they go all the way back to the castle and manage to make it all the way. No one dies. So just past 4 p.m., we're now hitting, yeah, 12 hours in the course of this whole battle. Um, the SS are attacking Castle Litter from behind, uh, or they're, they're surrounding Castle Litter, and they are attacked from behind by the 142nd Infantry Regiment, the 753rd Tank Battalion, and Kramer's Kukovic, and, you know, the whole nine yards, basically. So they're all gone. They are all defeated. They are either captured or killed, and finally, the war is over. Again, Germany's official surrender a few days later, but the battle is over. The 12 hour battle, yay! But there's a little bit more. We have to talk about the aftermath. So the French VIPs were formally handed over to the Americans. There was, a, there was a, an SS fellow I mentioned way back in the beginning who was just like, dude, I don't care. I have none of these ideals. It wasn't the fellow who got killed. He had just been assigned to come to the castle. It was like, you should come. The French got a hold of him and said, there's no SS here. We know you won't actually do anything to kill us, so do you want to pretend to be capturing us? So the guy was like, yeah, that's fine. When the Americans showed up, he was just like, right, I'm surrendering. Just take them. Fine, go away. <laughs> so some of the far right of the French were put on trial because it was just very, very... The, the Vichy government that took over in France while Hitler was in power was not all the greatest, and there were a few far right prisoners, so they were tried but pretty much left off the hook. It was just like, no, you guys didn't really see what was coming. Eventually they all did defect against Vichy, so it was fine. So unfortunately... Uh, Jack Lee, who was the American tank that led everything, he kind of had a downward spiral, a bunch of dead in career paths. He died of alcoholism in 1973. Um, that was unfortunate. But the rest of the American troops made it out in pretty good state. The remaining Wehrmacht soldiers were all POWs because they're Germans. Really? We helped them escape, guys. I think they were eventually let out. Um, and finally, Crobot and uh, he was the cook was let go, he was let to head off to Eastern Europe, as was Kukovic. He managed to find all the belongings of the French VIPs, and then he's like, cool, well, um, I'm gonna go back to Yugoslavia. And they said, cool, you helped us win the war. Do whatever you want. <laughs> so I don't really have much to say more about this. It's this really harebrained, crazy battle of, you need to go here. No, okay, I'm over here. Well, we need people to go over here. No, you need to go over there. It's all over the place while this is all going on this crazy harebrained thing that was like three or four different villages, a ton of people fighting, several different nationalities, and the Germans and the Americans fighting together, being like, you know what, Nazism is over with. We can fight together and we can finally put an end to this. I personally think that's a whole lot better. So I'm gonna raise a glass to the Americans that fought and defended Castle Litter, the French that eventually took up alongside them additional arms, and to the Germans that put away the ideals of the Nazi party and decided to fight along to win the war. Thank you, Jonathan. That was the most confusing game of risk I have ever witnessed. <laughs> <laughs> and now I've broken the mic stand. Because, because, because I'm the sound guy, right? Yep, yep. I had one job. Thank you. Someone has paid attention to previous lessons. It clearly wasn't me. All right. <laughs> Moving along. Uh, our, for our next talk, uh, Filthy Lucre, the story of Whistler's Peacock Room by Lynn Rudder, who is joining us for the first time on this stage. <laughs> so a big hand for Lynn. Lynn. Nice necklace. <laughs> hey. You know why donkeys don't go to college? Because nobody likes a smart ass. Oh. I think we're off to a great start. Yes. <laughs> Hello. Okay. I've also never used Keynote before, so that's going to be lots of fun. <laughs> I'm here to talk about The Peacock Room by James McNeil Whistler. This is the most original and famous room in 19th century London. And it is scarcely mentioned without also mentioning how the wealthy patron refused to pay the artist who created it. Now, I am myself a decorative painter, and I do this kind of work for a living. So I have a little insight into how this happened. How this room came to be created, and what happened afterwards, 
is a little bit more complicated than I can do in 10 minutes. And it's certainly not something you're going to see in Wikipedia in a nice condensed little nut. But the story goes is that the artist and his patron fought a war for well over a year. The arena, the dining room of a tastefully decorated Victorian mansion. The stakes, $200,000 and much more. And the prize, I don't know, we'll see if anybody won anything. To set the scene, let's travel back to Victorian England in the 1870s. This is typical Victorian art. It is all about edifying moral lessons, classical subjects, and romantic history. Now, I'm not saying that these aren't beautiful, but they are proselytizing, English values. And the avant-garde artists, like Rossetti here, they reject all of this in favor of beauty without any other lofty message. The aesthetic movement, as it came to be known, proselytized beauty. And their motto was art for art's sake. They invented it. In addition, there's a fascination with Japanese art, as you can see in these two paintings. This kind of work is rejected by the Salon in Paris, and it's attacked by critics in London. But they are adored by a growing segment of the population who just happens to be buying a lot of art. So now, let's meet our contestants in tonight's conference. James Abbott McNeil Whistler is an American expat, very methodical and skilled painter of great vision. He is the leader of the aesthetic avant-garde. He's also a dandy and a bon vivant, and you know that because he's wearing a monocle. <laughs> he, ex <laughs> he excels at the art of self-promotion. Many of his paintings have really long musical titles, like Symphony in White Number no. 3, or Arrangement in Black and Gray, number one. Also known as Whistler's Mother, yes. That's great. This is all going to be on the test, by the way, so. <laughs> so drink for you. And in this corner, we have Frederick Richards Leyland, a self-made tycoon. He is a shipbuilder. He's also an amateur musician devoted to Chopin. He plays the piano. And Whistler credits this favorite patron of his for inspiring these musical titles for his paintings. Leland commissions a number of paintings from Whistler, including this portrait of him and this one of his wife, which is called Symphony in Flesh, Color, and Pink. <laughs> yeah. So... Now we know where we are. In 1875, Leyland decides to build a new house in a very fashionable district of London, and he hires Thomas Jekyll to decorate the dining room, where he has decided to put one of Whistler's paintings, The Princess from the Land of Porcelain, to have pride of place above the mantle. Now, Mr. Jekyll, the architect, is a preeminent designer in the aesthetic style, and he's famous for Anglo-Japanese metalwork and furnishings like really cool sunflower and irons. Especially for Mr. Leyland's dining room, Jekyll has designed a lattice of walnut shelving to display blue and white porcelain, very valuable collection of china. Jekyll's design also features 16th century leather wall hangings, which were part of the dowry of Catherine of Aragon. That is the first wife of Henry VIII and the longest lived. So that's 400-year-old leather wall panels that once hung in the bedroom of the King of England and for which Leyland pays 1,000 pounds. That's nearly $100,000 now. When the room gets to be pretty close to being done, Jekyll decides to ask Whistler for a little color consulting. And Whistler comes in and says, hmm, I don't think that my princess looks very good with that leather. So he volunteers to retouch. <laughs> retouch the walls with yellow and gold and, and make them look nice. <clears throat> so 
Leyland thinks, well, this is all pretty sad. I'm, I'm going to go back to Liverpool and work on some more ships. Thank you. <laughs> Alone in the house, Whistler decides his, to start his enhancements by gilding every single piece of wood in the entire room. <laughs> gilding and, and then painting peacock feathers all over the entire ceiling. Gilding and then painting peacocks on the shutters. Enhancements. Basically, he makes this entire beautiful walk-in work of art, which he then entitles Harmony in Blue and Gold, The Peacock Room. Voila! <laughs> now, I look at this, and I can totally hear what's going on in his head, because this is what I would be saying. Like, I don't know how I can work with these ugly leather walls, and I just think that blue and white china looks so much better with gold leaf, and you can never have too much gold leaf, so we're going to put more gold leaf on the shutters. <laughs> And you know, I think Leland's really gonna like this. He's gonna come in here and he's going to piss himself because this is beautiful. <laughs> this is <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> this is what artists are thinking when they're in your house. <sighs> While Leyland is gone, Whistler writes him a few times asking for money for gold leaf. He also has a couple of press conferences, and by the time Leland gets back to London, London is talking about this room. Which is not at all what Leyland expects. And not only that, but you know, he painted over the leather <laughs> that hung in the bedroom of the King of England, and that cost a thousand pounds. A hundred thousand dollars worth of leather, covered in blue. It gets better. Whistler leaves an invoice for 2,000 guineas, asking for more money for the extra work that he did. That's like $200,000. That's a lot of money. And Whistler thinks it's marvelous. And he just is popping by all the time with potential clients and showing off the room. And he just doesn't, doesn't understand what the problem is. He says, I have a quote. My dear Baron, I gave you a brilliant surprise. The room is alive with beauty. There's no room in London like it, mon cher. See, because he's wearing a monocle, he can also speak French. <laughs> yes. And he signs everything ever yours, James McNeil Whistler, with a little butterfly which is made out of his initials. A signature butterfly. And here is Leyland's response. Look, Jimmy, I've received your bill, and I think we should settle up our account, but I really don't think you should have involved me in such an outrageous amount of expense without at least telling me ahead of time. Yours truly, Frederick Harleyland. Oh, but mon cher, you know, I just painted on and on without design or sketch. I put in every touch with such freedom. And the harmony and blue and gold developing, and you know, I just forgot everything in my joy of it. <laughs> Edward Lewis. <laughs> the artist formerly known as Whistler. <laughs> Give me a fucking break. <laughs> it's like, it just happened. Like, I was just taking a shower with my girlfriends, and, you know, they just, I don't know, it just happened. <laughs> not, not that I would know. <laughs> so anyway, I'm calling bullshit on this lame-ass, arty-farty excuse, because the fact is that this is a lot of work, and Whistler is known as a methodical painter. I think this room was liquored up and seduced by a very smooth-talking artist who had a lot of preparatory sketches. Books and books of them. They found them in his studio after he died. So I'm not buying that story. Anyway, back to Leyland. He doesn't want to pay the bill. He says these shutters are stupid. They're ridiculous. Please, let's come to an agreement. Fine then. We shall split the cost of the room 
But mon cher, art will outlive money, and your fame is now assured as the unappreciative owner of a work of art whose price you refuse to pay. Ever yours. <laughs> there are dozens of letters back and forth between these guys, and it's, it, it actually goes on for nine months. It takes nine months before Leyland finally relents and sends Whistler a check for a thousand pounds. Now, <laughs> can you actually see that? Okay. <laughs> pounds are not the customary silver guineas. Guineas are worth a little bit more than pounds, so now the price has been shorted by about $3,000, and this is the customary way you pay tradesmen, not artists. So Whistler is super offended. So what does he do? Well, of course, he breaks back into the house <laughs> and paints another mural. <laughs> Behold, and of course, another passive aggressive note. Behold the silver crest peacock on the left, c'est moi, the artiste. The other, bedecked with coins and bristling silver feathers on the throat, well, that's the patron in his customary frilled shirt front. Now the painting is known to all of London as Art and Money, or the story of the room. Sir, you have degenerated into nothing but an artistic Barnum, a con artist. I will forbid my servants to admit you, and if I find you near my wife... <laughs> I shall have you publicly horsewhipped. <laughs> Yours truly, Frederick R. Leyland. <laughs> well, from a business point of view, money is all important, but for the artiste, the work alone remains the fact. Ever yours, James Abbott McNeil Whistler. <laughs> what about Thomas Jekyll? What happened to Thomas Jekyll? the original designer of the room, whose work has basically just been shanghaied in the middle of this. Well, he didn't take this very well. They found him on the floor of his studio covered in bits of gold leaf. I'm not kidding. And he died three years later in an insane asylum. This is what we call collateral damage in the War of the Peacocks. Now, the following year, Whistler was bankrupt and he was forced to auction off his house and everything in it. This is just another painting, don't pay any attention. Among the creditors, none other than Freddie Leyland, who for some twisted reason has been going around buying up all of Whistler's debts, like the gas bill and the grocer's tab, which if you think about it is a really calculated long-term revenge. This painting was left in plain view when the creditors arrived to liquidate the house. Here's Leyland dressed in a hideous peacock suit, sitting on top of Whistler's house, wearing a frilly shirt. The title of the painting on the sheet music there. It's called The Gold Scab, or Eruption in Frilthy Lucre. <laughs> enfin, the artiste gets the last word yet again, and the message this time is loud and clear. Hey, asshole, my art is more important than your money. Now, Frances Leyland left her husband just after this incident, and she took her portrait with her. <laughs> Frederick Leyland kept the peacock room exactly as Whistler intended it until after his death in 1892. Whistler never saw the room again, but he did live long enough to see it sold to a more appreciative owner. The princess and the entire peacock room moved to America, where Charles Langfrier, built a special wing into his Detroit home. In 1908, the Peacock Room became a sensation all over again, this time in the US. Designers and artists praised it as the first example of Art Nouveau decor 30 years ahead of its time. Now, it's in the Smithsonian, where it remains inspiration for subsequent generations of artists and designers. And a fabulous example of that is this outstanding installation by Darren Watterson, which was created just a few years ago. The peacocks here are tearing each other's entrails out. <laughs> and the shelves are collapsing and oozing under the weight of all that animosity. 
the peacock room of Dorian Gray. <laughs> so as a piece of art, the peacock room may well smack of pride. But I see in it now, 140 years after it was created, an enduring message about the struggle of beauty to survive in a world that insists on justifying the cost of everything. And as Whistler predicted, his patron's name is all but forgotten, while his art remains beautiful and remains relevant. So, please join me in a toast to that which endures regardless of infamy or expense, to art for art's sake. Thank you, Lynn, for that cautionary tale about inviting artists into your home. <laughs> Never a good idea. Uh. <sighs> oh, you forgot your fin. 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 And next, we have James Mannion with On a Raft, On a Sea, On the Sea, a cultural mutiny of class and art. Please welcome James. Just a little bit lower. All right, uh, so I figured with the topic of mutiny and kind of where everybody thinks we're going to go with it, uh, we should have at least one talk in the first half that covers a ship. Yes! Yeah, yeah, make sure. There's going to be a lot of ships in this. We need to make sure we get it through. Everybody good? Everybody good? Cool, moving on. <laughs> All right, so the ship. Thank you. The ship that we're going to be talking about quite a bit tonight is the Medusa, a French frigate. Uh, it was commissioned in 1810 and was uh, used largely throughout the Napoleonic Wars, uh, immediately after which it became a ferry in 1816, uh, when it was uh, meant to take a bunch of French officials to St. Louis and Senegal as part of the imperialism game with British handing off Senegal to the French. Um, everything else that I tell you in the story is predicated on one important fact, uh, the captain of the ship, Viscount Chaumet is an idiot. That's important. Nothing makes sense unless you recognize this man is dumb, or at least ill-equipped to captain a ship. So uh, the original course uh, was supposed to go from uh, Madeira uh, to um, Senegal. Uh, it didn't quite make it. Uh, the Medusa had a total uh, complement of 400 with about 160 crew. Uh, and for reasons that are beyond me, uh, our captain decided that a man named Richfort, who was a philosopher, should be the navigator. He said he knew a lot about it. Um, and uh, he mistake some clouds uh, for Africa, <laughs> specifically uh, the Cape of Bucco in Mauritania, uh, and drastically underestimated where they were, which wouldn't be so bad if they were with the other four vessels that was traveling with them, um, but they weren't, because the captain was like, we can make better time, we're a much faster ship. So they ditched those guys right out of port. Um, and abruptly, and uh, kind of obviously, uh, hit a sandbar, about 30 miles off the coast of Mauritania. Uh, and they hit it during high tide, which is a bad sign. So they're having a lot of trouble refloating this boat, especially because the captain was very uninterested in ditching his cannons, which weighed about 85 or uh, 84,000 pounds. Uh, and he was like, nah, we don't need to do that. Um, and because this is a story about a shipwreck, uh, there are not enough lifeboats, <laughs> obviously. Uh, they could only take about half the people, um, and it's 30 miles over rough waters. They don't want to make two trips, so they have a new idea. They're like, we're going to make a raft, like a really shitty one, recognizably. Like, they didn't try to make it good, and the whole idea was that they would just take all the cargo, put it on the raft, refloat the boat, and then put everything back on. It would be great. And that would have worked, except for on July 5th, the next day, a gale threatened to break the boat apart, and there was mass hysteria. <laughs> So the captain was like, we need to get the hell's bells out. Uh, and he loads everybody of prominence, importance, and with a little bit of money onto those lifeboats. And they were like, okay, dudes, everybody else onto this raft, and we'll tow you to shore. It's going to be great. <laughs> Don't even worry about it. Infrastructure like you wouldn't believe. Um, so 146 men and one woman uh, pile onto this raft. And they set out for shore. And then all the people on the lifeboats are like, oh, shit. Lifeboats aren't equipped to pull a raft with 146 people, 147 people on it, uh, and basically immediately cut the rope. Like, just immediately, like minutes. Not hours, not days, minutes. 
Uh, and this raft was not designed with any way to propel itself. It did not have any means of steering. Um, and to make matters worse, they had about a day's worth of rations of ship's biscuits, and most of the containers which they believed to be water were wine. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. It's really bad. So in the first night, one night, 20 people are either killed or commit suicide. Uh, over the rough seas, only the middle of the raft stays afloat entirely out of water, and there's just a struggle to stay on there for days. Um, people get drunk and fall off the boat. Cannibalism starts on the fourth day. Oh. <laughs> on the eighth day, four days of cannibalism, the fittest people left are like, this is not going well. We need to conserve our rations, which are cannibalism. Uh, so they throw all of the remaining infirmed people off the boat. All 15 people who are left after this action are going to survive until uh, July 17th. That's 12 days on the raft, when one of the other boats in the convoy finds them by chance. No one went looking. No one knew this happened. They didn't report it. They just left it out there. So these, uh, these um, 15 people are saved. Uh, five more die within days of being rescued. Uh, so, that's that. Uh, and you guys might be like, I didn't hear much about mutiny. And that's because the real mutiny happens after these events in, oh, what, more art. More art? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Given tonight, that's a thing now. All right, totally a thing. <laughs> cool. Um, so... In a lot of these talks, art. art, in a lot of these talks, we kind of use historical paintings as a means of explanation. But, you know, there's an actual huge story that goes on with a lot of these, no more so than this, um, Jericho's Raft of the Medusa. Uh, it took him two years to produce. He basically heard this story, was so incensed that he's like, at 25, this is going to be my, like, big thing that I do to get known. Um, and it's an uncommissioned work, and it's huge. It's massive. Like, this is not as big as it is. This is as big as it is. It's 16 by 24 feet. Um, just a huge, huge work. Um, and it marks kind of the beginning of the Romantic era. Um, but it sits right at the precipice, where it still holds on to a lot of like, what was happening beforehand, which was neoclassical. Um, so to look at that a little bit, like this is a, a huge, giant neoclassical painting, um, similar to the size of like a Jericho. Um, and it, is, you know, this is the Oath of the Harate, and it's a historical story. It is made to embolden and uh, talk about the clout of the people who had it made, and it tells the story of heroic, muscly, perfect dudes. That's what's going on. Coming next, romanticism. More realistic people, high emotions, and naked women. Generally naked women, lots of them. Not specific women, but idea women. And uh, uh, this is a Delacroix, and you can't tell me that a uh, Delacroix, who was a friend and student of Jericho, didn't get some ideas about framing from him. But yeah, so, so Jericho, he spends years on this, sketch after sketch after sketch. He gets corpses from a local morgue so he can see how flesh putrefies. He does life drawings of friends. Uh, he does the composition over and over and over until we get this final work. Um, just a couple of seconds on the composition of it, which is pretty incredible. It doesn't have a center. Instead, it's built on these two pyramids. Um, and each of them, like, kind of moves the eye along. Uh, the first showing the despair, moving to the salvation, and then that kind of points you to something you guys probably missed, but a tiny, tiny boot in this huge, huge piece that is their salvation coming. Um, ship. <laughs> but, like... All of the action is happening on this raft, so much so that you probably didn't even notice the huge tidal wave that's about to come on the other side of the piece. Um, so this was unveiled at the Paris Salon of 1819 to really mixed reviews. Um, to understand why those reviews were mixed, we also need some historical context. And I'm sorry, we're going to do this quick. Does anybody here know a lot about Napoleonic era France? Great. So you are not going to like this part of the talk. And anybody who has more questions about it should see that person. <laughs> All right, here we go. So, uh, 1789, the French Revolution starts. 1791, Jericho's born. 1799, uh, Napoleon overthrows uh, the Directory, which is a cool name, uh, in a bloodless coup d'etat, uh, and the revolution is basically over. 
1801, uh, France ends its participation in slavery. Uh, 1802, the, foreign le or the Legion of Honor is formed. That's not important to the talk, but it's just cool. Um, <laughs> And then uh, Napoleon crowns himself in 1804. Between 1814 and 1815, Napoleon's exiled a couple of times. But finally, the monarchy is restored, this time as a constitutional monarchy, under uh, Louis XVIII, who is a Bourbon and a very conservative monarch. So, and then we get to the, salon, or the voyage in 1816 of the Medusa and our salon in 1819. So relatively contemporary, much more so than you would get from a true history painting. And we get this painting. So now, why was it controversial? Well, one, a lot of critics were like, uh, it's a bunch of dead people. That's not pretty. Like, that's not really what art's supposed to be. Uh, but other than that, um, there's politics all over this. Jericho uh, was a huge um, abolitionist. Uh, and so it's no, um, it's no, what is the word? Coincidence that the uh, main heroic figure uh, is the only um, black man who survived. Uh, also, uh, the reason that our captain was there was because after uh, Napoleon was ousted, uh, he got his appointment through politics. Um, it was a political appointment, and he uh, was incompetent, and it basically became shorthand for being anti-monarchy, anti-Bourbon. So all of this politics was going on here, and that just wasn't what art was at the time. And so I have a question, and I'm legitimately asking, why does everyone think, anybody can shout, why did he paint this? Art. <laughs> That's why. He painted it because there was now an audience for it. And this is the mutiny we're talking about. Culture is changing. The patronage system is breaking down. Massive, fine works are no longer just for the church, the state, and incredibly wealthy people. There's an appetite this, for this in the middle class. So even though it looked kind of like that neoclassical work that was there, it's actually ideologically more similar to an Oliver Stone movie than it would be to any art that came before. Um, to kind of further this point, uh, it was so controversial that uh, the Louvre did not purchase the work after the Salon. And instead, he's like, screw it. He sent it to uh, the UK, and he made twice as much as he would have selling it to a museum through ticket sales for just people who wanted to see this controversial work. And that's basically from this flashpoint how art progresses in Western society. You had, actually, our last talk goes over this quite a bit. Um, you had, like, the Barbizon School and people who did things that would appeal to a middle-class sensibility without any sort of um, political weight to it. It's just pretty. It classes up any house, right? <laughs> Much like the Great British Bake Off. <laughs> no, nobody has a problem with the Great British Bake Off. It's great, right? Uh, or you can go the other way that you attract the middle class. That's right. Naked people and violence, right? <laughs> Very contemporaneous. So this work is at that moment. This is the time when an artist got autonomy to kind of do what they wanted and knew that they could find an audience for that and make money doing it, which is why it also still feels incredibly relevant. You can look at this and you can think about the refugee crisis, you can think about our current state of government, and you wouldn't be that off of what the artist intended you to think about when you looked at the work, um, which is why I think it's still referenced so much uh, Banksy, Martin uh, Kippenberg, John Cornell, this is evidently Paul McCartney's favorite painting, Max Ernst, uh, uh, Louis Fishman, uh, even Doctor Who, and the Pogues have uh, all referenced this painting. Um, so I kind of want to do a counterpoint to, to our last talk uh, and just say to uh, the autonomy of artists to create and know that they can get paid. Thank you very much uh, for that cautionary tale about not letting artists on your ship. No, that's not what that was. was <laughs> Thank you very much for the excuse to have a specific song played at intermission, which it's time for intermission. Uh, before you go get your drink, you should know, we are building an Adventure Harvey map of tiny little Adventure Harveys, which you can get at the merch table, previously mentioned. Other things at the merch table. Yay, capitalism! <laughs> uh, 
these lovely glasses. We have a new series of glasses. Um, this one has Krakatoa on it. There's another one that has a bear attack. There's an entire series. So if you like volcanoes, bear attacks, or basically any other, or a, a kraken, what else do we have? Any? Airships, like we got everything. You you want a glass? You want one of the glasses? Also, advanced tickets for upcoming shows at a discount at the table. Um, so the adventurer Harvey's, um, he has. So the way this works is you take your Harvey and you go out uh, on an adventure and you take a picture of him and you hashtag it adventure Harvey and then we find them. So he's been exploring some local history. He's been. Visiting the jungles of Colombia. I'm not sure that's actually Colombia, but it claims to be, so yeah. Uh, and the beaches and forts of Panama. Oh, yeah. Uh, and he met a friend. Oh. So, now. <laughs> I set myself up for that one. All right, now we're gonna take a short cocktail break. So uh, get a drink, uh, go get some merch, get some glasses, get some pens, whatever. Uh, when we come back, we have more talks. Uh, Andre will be talking about uh, the mutiny in modern art. Uh, Christina will be talking about an eggnog riot, which you wanna stick around for that. And Aneta will be coming back with the story, the rest of the story that you don't know about the mutiny on the bounty. So get a drink, come back. Max, give me some pogues.